Hi, this is Justin Colletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today, we're going to be talking about why it is so hard to make money in music. And I'm going to take you down this journey where I'm going to make things seem really bleak and really bad and really impossible for your prospects of making money in music. But then if you stick through to the end, we're going to turn it around and we're going to talk about ways to make it happen anyway. It is entirely possible to make money, even a good, comfortable living doing music, and without being super duper famous. And we'll talk about paths and strategies and all of that. But in order to do that, you've got to understand why music is different and what makes it different from other ways you could make a living. And I've got some powerful analogies here for you that I think you really should understand. And one of them, one of the core things we're going to be talking about is the fact The indisputable fact, I think, that music is not a spectator sport. It is a participant sport. But that is something that has shifted a little bit over time. There was this brief period in history where it seemed like music was a spectator sport. And we got these memes in our brains about the way making a living in music should look from this very unusual, abnormal period in history. And we have to wipe that out of our brains. And I hope that today I'm going to help give you the big mindset shift that you're going to need to make a go of having music as a career, as a side hustle, as even just a sustainable hobby that pays you back some money. Or honestly, if you're just a hobbyist, this is interesting stuff to know about the culture of music and how music and its place in our lives has changed over history. I think there's a fascinating story in here. Before we get into all of this, including some concrete ideas about how you can make money in music if you really want to, the only thing that I have to do is to give the briefest of shout outs to this week's sponsors, the most important sponsor in this podcast always being you. How do you sponsor? By hitting the like button, hit the subscribe, the notifications bell, all that good stuff if you're on YouTube, or consider giving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or the podcast platform of your choice. really does help spread the word. But the best way you can sponsor this podcast is by sponsoring yourself. Whether you're an impassioned hobbyist or someone who wants to have a career in music, the courses like Mixing Breakthroughs are going to improve the way that you work in mixing for the better forever guaranteed or your money back. Check it out at mixingbreakthroughs.com. Or if you want to learn everything that I know about mastering, so you can get into mastering for yourself, check it out over at masteringdemystified.com. Again, money back guarantee on that one. Know you're going to love it. This week's brand sponsors include Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. Also, big shout out and thanks to Fab Filter making some awesome use them anywhere workhorse plugins from EQs to compressors to DSers to saturation and delay and more. More about those guys later. Let's get right into the meat of this week's episode. All right, what do I mean about this idea of music being a participant sport, not a spectator sport? To understand this, I think we need some analogies. And I'm going to start by drawing selfishly on one of my favorite analogies, which is a sport that I do, jiu-jitsu. In case you're not familiar with it, it's a combat sport, basically, that involves submission holds. It's kind of like fighting without all of the punching, which is one of the things that I like about it. It's a wonderful sport, great way to stay in shape if you're a weirdo who doesn't mind grappling with grown men. Basically, pretending at killing each other until someone taps and says, stop, you got me. Now, the thing about jiu-jitsu that's really interesting is that there are some world champion jiu-jitsu athletes who people who do jiu-jitsu know the names of. But by and large, jiu-jitsu is not a spectator sport. And it's like music in this way. And sometimes it helps to get away from music, the thing that we're concentrating on, to really see it afresh. And you see this in jiu-jitsu. And I'll bring up a few other examples too. But in jiu-jitsu, you see that most people who watch jiu-jitsu also do jiu-jitsu. Almost everyone who watches jiu-jitsu matches does jiu-jitsu themselves. And honestly, a lot of the people who do jiu-jitsu themselves don't even watch jiu-jitsu matches. It is almost as purely as you can get a participant sport rather than a spectator sport. Contrast this to something like boxing, where boxing athletes make way more money than jiu-jitsu athletes. And most people who watch boxing 
don't box. Most people who watch boxing have maybe never been punched in the face in their lives, which is probably a good thing. You don't need to go around getting punched in the face or punch people in the face in your life in general. And you also don't need to do that to enjoy boxing. Really interesting sport if you're into it. You watch someone like Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali or any of these greats. They're really artists in their own right. But that is very much a spectator sport. It's a sport that's about people watching it rather than doing it. There are other sports you can think about. Which of these categories do they fall into? Are they spectator sports that are about people watching it? Or are they participant sports that are about people doing it? And generally speaking, in spectator sports, the people who are doing these at the highest level, who win that race to the top, can make a ton of money. And even the people who aren't at the very top of the top, but are still like somewhere high up along the top, a lot of those people can make decent amounts of money as well, even if most people don't know their names. But there's a lot of other sports that aren't like this. In America, what we call soccer is a participant sport more than a spectator sport. Kids and sometimes adults do it, and very few of them actually watch soccer on TV. It's different in other places of the world. Basketball is one of those things that's a little bit in between where there's, it's kind of a participant sport, kind of a spectator sport. There are people who watch basketball who don't do it. There are people who play basketball who just for fun who aren't watching it all the time. So yeah, there's some gray areas. And there's even gray areas in music and in jiu-jitsu. But by and large, music is and probably should be a participant sport. Now, the funny thing that happened is there was this brief period in post-war America, in the post-war Western world, in Europe and England, where music became more of a spectator sport than a participant sport. Why was this? Was it about media consolidating more and more? So all of a sudden you had these channels that could create music superstars, where everyone could have common reference points of the famous musicians. And this world of major labels started to emerge more and more. And there are vestiges of this to this day. There are extremely popular artists like a Beyonce or a Jay-Z or a Taylor Swift, where you check these people out and music for a moment almost seems like it is a spectator sport. But it's not. If you look at how many records Taylor Swift has ever sold, and compare that to the number of records that Michael Jackson or Nirvana was selling in the 90s, I mean, it's a fraction. The music world has become fractured and dispersed. And I'd argue that this is a lot more natural and much more like the way people have been experiencing music throughout history, with that exception of like, I don't know, the 1950s through the 1990s, which is a little blip of time compared to the great expanse of human history. Prior to that great consolidation in music that happened, particularly we saw it reach its zenith in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, where the album was king and there were several megastars in each genre that people were familiar with that made a ton of money. Just prior to that, by a few decades, music was much more regional. There were much more regional stars or regional professionals. And music was much more participatory. The people listening to it were much more likely to be doing it themselves. And that's something that since the advent of inexpensive computers and DAWs and the whole explosion in home recording and home electronic music that has occurred, music is going back in that direction again of being participatory like it has been since the beginning. I mean, it's baked into the DNA of every single human being to know and understand and be interested in music to some degree. Of course, people have varying aptitudes. And yes, you might say, well, my aunt is totally tone deaf or my brother or my mom or my sister, whoever it is. You have someone in your family or a close friend, you know, who just isn't interested in music at all and is tone deaf. Sure, that happens. But music is part of the human structure, just like all of these other things. Humans are, to a degree, naturally athletic. We want to move our bodies. And yes, you might say, well, I'm totally unathletic, or I know people who are totally unathletic. It's like, 
yeah, there's varying degrees of aptitude, but there's also varying degrees of how much you ignore a part of your humanity. And I would say people that aren't physically active at all are ignoring part of their humanity. Just like people who aren't interested in music at all are ignoring part of their humanity. Maybe some of those people have a lower aptitude in it and less interest naturally, but it's still part of all of us. And the way people experienced music for the vast majority of human history was together, in groups, making it together. And if you watch footage of hunter-gatherer tribes today, that's the way they experience music today, making it as a community. Sure, some of the people are less engaged, have less aptitude, less interest, and they're playing more of a supporting role. And sure, they have their stars, or the people who can sing the best, and the people who can dance the best, just like they have their stars and the people who can hunt the best and who can fish the best. There's a range of outcomes in every human endeavor. With most of us clustering around mediocre or less, and a few people are amazing and they're being a little bit in between. But music, throughout almost all of human history, has been this participant sport, where it's something that everyone is expected to be engaged in. And why this wasn't the case from the 1950s through the 1990s, roughly, I mean, there's so many reasons. Some of it is that centralization of media. Some of it may be the advent of passive styles of entertainment, like television taking over more and more. And kids who would otherwise have been learning music in their communities and in their homes spend some of that time passively watching television, whatever it might be. But now, more and more people are participating again, as atomized as we sometimes are in front of our laptop screens doing it. Maybe collaborating through the internet instead of getting into a drum circle. Maybe guesting on each other's tracks instead of playing in a band together. But no matter the reasons, the plain and simple point is that the economics of a spectator sport are very different from the economics of a participant sport. I want to read to you really quickly. I think it'll give some insights into music in a microcosm. A little post written not too long ago by the highest paid jiu-jitsu athlete in the world. By a large margin, a guy named Gordon Ryan, who you've probably never heard of unless you do jiu-jitsu. This is an even more extreme case of the dynamic that exists in music. But I want to read it to you because this is what's at the heart of why it's difficult to make an income in music and what in your mind you need to shift to make an income in music today. Gordon Ryan is an amazingly skilled technician and artist, I would say. The gulf between how well he performs and how well the other top performers in the entire world of the sport, it's just enormous. I remember when I had been doing jiu-jitsu for only about a year and a half, I had a role, a sparring session, with a guy named Mateus Dinez, who had just won in his weight class at the most prestigious grappling competition in the entire world. It's called ADCC. And the long story short is that in our three-minute sparring session, he submitted me eight times with the same exact move again and again. It was like being on a different planet where physics worked differently. It was like grappling with a Martian. And then... I ended up one day seeing this same amazing jiu-jitsu practitioner compete against Gordon Ryan. And he was being ragdolled by Gordon Ryan the way that, same way that he was ragdolling me. So the gulf between me and this amazing competitor and the gulf between him and the guy who was on top of it all, I'm not going to say they're equally as big, but even there, the gulf was surprisingly big. Yet this guy doesn't make a ton of money by the standards of what people think of when they think of superstardom. So Gordon Ryan writes of jiu-jitsu, and I think this applies to music in a slightly less severe way. He writes, being a pro athlete, not a teacher in jiu-jitsu, there are many young and aspiring athletes looking to make a career. So Gordon Ryan, at the top of his game, writes something very interesting that I think that a lot of people in music another participant sport, can learn a lot from. He writes, In jiu-jitsu, there are many young and aspiring athletes looking to make a career off of competing. But before we begin, I want to explain a little something. 
Here's a part you may or may not agree with, but it's worth hearing him out on. It is my belief that a man living in New Jersey, New York, California, or any other high-tax state can live comfortably on $200,000 a year. When I say comfortably, I don't mean extravagantly. Now, if $200,000 a year sounds like a lot to you, I'll tell you, I did live in New York City, and I now live in New Hampshire, and I can tell you from having lived in those two different places that, yeah, $200,000 in New York City is going to get you the equivalent in New York City of a reasonably kind of normal middle class <laughs> living somewhere else. That's how expensive New York City was at the point that I was living there and probably still is. But you take that number, $200,000, that pales in comparison to what people at the top of, say, a sport like boxing make. We'll get more into that in a second. I'll skip forward a little bit to read. Keep in mind that I am by far the highest paid athlete in this sport. And if I competed in all the events I was supposed to by the end of the year, this would have been the first year in my grappling career that I had made around $200,000 from competitions only. And you can think of jujitsu competitions as being a little bit like releasing albums in the world of music. When you think about that for a second, it seems insane. And that's competing almost once a month. Hopefully in the future this will change, but before you put your eggs in one basket of competition, think about this is what you really want to do. For young athletes, competition is a great way to build your brand. But because grappling is a participant sport where most who watch are those who participate, most of your income will be from teaching. Use competition to build a brand and use teaching to make money. Being a good teacher is far harder than being a good competitor. Being good at jiu-jitsu and being good at winning competitions aren't always synonymous. It's very true about being good at music and being good at making albums that resonate with people that they want to buy. There's so much more that goes into this, but Instagram limits caption sizes, so just a little word of advice for those who are trying to make it. He actually went deeper to share the percentage breakdowns of where his income comes from, and for him and his participant sport, the overwhelming amount of income came from people buying instructional videos that he made that want to learn to do jujitsu as well as him. Another big chunk came from sponsorships, brands that wanted to be associated with someone who other people look up to and admire. And then some portion of his income also came from actually competing and winning prizes from competing. And then there's some income that come from private lessons and running a school and all of that. Now, I'm not saying that you should go off and become a teacher, necessarily. But I will say that throughout all of human history, the most accomplished musicians were almost always people who taught others at least a little bit. And this wasn't true just in music. It was true in other things that were historically participant sports, like painting. You look at the great artist Rembrandt, who is acclaimed to this day for his breakthroughs in the way people use light and perspective and color and really being a great influence in the way that painting came after him. And he made a decent amount of his money painting, often painting portraits for people, but he made a lot of money teaching rich people's snot-nosed kids how to paint. And also probably some adult amateurs as well. This is also true of so many of the great composers throughout history. A lot of them, in addition to, I mean, for a lot of history, having more of the patron model, that's like being associated with a brand, they also had income from educating, or they had income from maybe providing participatory musical experiences for people. Say, within the church was a great place that music happened for a large part of human history. But this is how it's basically always been in music, with the exception of this little blip of a period in the mid to late 20th century, where music really started to look like a spectator sport. It's always been a participant sport. So if you're looking to make an income in music, one of the things that you can do is release music for other people to hear. That's the album. That's the single. That's the streaming. But another big component is teaching other people who just to enrich their lives want to do more music in their lives because it's a meaningful part of their lives and helping them do music 
almost as well as you do. That's another big way people have always made money off of music. But that's not the only thing. There's also creating participatory events that people can collaborate in. And this can be as simple as concerts. There is good reason that in recent decades, most popular musicians have made more money off of their concerts, off of their live experiences, than they have off of record sales. There was this unusual blip, maybe in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, where these recording formats were new, where sometimes people would put on concerts almost as a loss leader to sell their high margin item, the record, that to some degree was almost like a token or a souvenir that the artist could monetize. But in the modern digital age, this is almost completely reversed where recordings are so inexpensive and so plentiful, where the recording for a lot of musicians is a loss leader for the other services they can provide. And a big one has been concerts, live participatory experiences. And sure, in the modern concert, a lot of times the audience isn't a big participant. They're a somewhat passive participant. But they're a more active participant often than the person by themselves listening to a record at home. And they're still getting some of those additional benefits from music. The community, the amazing experience of seeing a bunch of people on stage or around you literally vibrating together at the same frequency. It's, it's an amazing experience, but there are other musicians, 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 people like Jacob Collier, if you've ever seen him, or Bobby McFerrin, where if you've seen them play live, they almost sometimes involve their audience so much to the degree where they're playing their audience as if their audience is a musical instrument, guiding them in kind of group sing-alongs and multi-part harmonies, spontaneously, without those people necessarily having to know how to read sheet music, and drawing the audience into participation in music. Just as human beings have been experiencing music throughout history, whether it was in an ancient drum circle or whether it was in some church or synagogue or cathedral or mosque where people are coming together and participating in music together. And so many people are missing those kinds of avenues for participatory music and connection with others in their daily lives. So in addition to teaching, the creating participatory experiences for people. That's another big component. And then there's the other component of patronage and branding. Patronage meaning appealing to people's good graces who really, really love music, who make a decent amount of money and just want to give you some because they think what you're doing is awesome. That's something to potentially appeal to. And then the fourth component is somewhat related to the prior one, but it's where that patron is looking for a little more in return. You helping to tell their story. Them benefiting from the fact that others look up to you. And if you can find actual products or brands or services or missions out there in the world that you can engage with, where that service or brand or product ends up getting its story told to more people who could benefit from it, and the people who buy into this service or brand or product or mission benefit from having done so, and you benefit for helping to bring those three together, there is nothing evil or sell out or wrong about that. So long as it's happening in exactly the way that I've described, where it's a net benefit for all those three parties. The brand, the medium, the actual people who benefit from and enjoy that product or service or mission. So we've talked about four things and never once did I talk about making records, which is the part of music that I love the most. I'm a mastering engineer. I used to work as a recording engineer and a music producer and a mixer. I love recorded music. But in today's economy, often that fifth aspect, almost the competitive part of music making, in the way that there are jujitsu competitions and boxing matches, this thing that everyone notices and pays the most attention to, is often a calling card for these other four items. 
you don't have to do all five of these things. You can probably make an income by doing just two or by doing three or by doing four of them, but those are the five components that make up income in music. If you think I missed one, let me know in the comments down below or email me over at podcast at sonicscoop.com. But I think almost anything that you can name falls into one of these five categories. I mean, maybe you can say that there's six of them. You can think of selling music to TV shows or films or video games, sync licensing, getting your music placed. But to me, that kind of falls under the category of branding, where you're using your music and to enhance someone else's product some third-party product. But maybe you can consider sync licensing its own separate sixth thing. And maybe you can throw in number seven, which is merchandising, right? You selling, you know, your t-shirts and your coasters or your <laughs> whatever you're going to sell other products. But in a way, that kind of falls under the patronage model. So broadly, I'd say there are these five, but yeah, you could take any of these five and split them out and arguably make it into seven. But in any case, this fifth one, of making records is unlikely, especially in the beginning, to be the lion's share of your income from music. And even for most major established artists today, it's not the major source of their income. It's often helping support these other sources of income. And if you can get these other sources of income to go up and to get really firing on all cylinders, this will often ironically help you actually grow the income from that fifth source, the actual making recorded music for other people to buy and hear. So these are the two things that I want you to take away from this. Number one is that music today is not a spectator sport. It's not so much about people buying other people's albums just to enjoy although that is a factor in music, it's not the primary factor. Music is even more so a participant sport where there are people who are doing music and those are the most likely people to buy music from you. And the music you make for them to listen to is just one of the things that you can actually sell to people. And the fact that it's more a participant sport than a spectator sport means it has very different economics than a spectator sport. And you have to get out of this mid to late 20th century mindset that so many of us are still stuck in, of that we're going to sit down, we're going to write and record a 12-song album all at once, and then we're going to release it all at once with no audience yet. That's probably not going to work for you. I've interviewed people who are very successful in getting their music heard and who have many spectators, many fans, and many listeners, and rarely do they take that approach to get where they wound up. And very rarely is their recorded music the one thing that's paying all their bills. If it's not something like more educational, it might be more patronage, or it might be more branding and licensing, or it might be more participatory in that they're creating group experiences for other people to create music along with them, or to at least experience music along with them. And that ties directly into the second key takeaway, which is that you are unlikely to make the majority of your income off of just record sales and streams and people being spectators of your art. You've got to think about how to engage with people in a participant sport that is music. And I wish you a great future, whether you're a hobbyist or a professional or an aspiring professional. A long, glorious future of tons of music and tons of sharing your music and musical experiences with others. I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast episode. This is a participatory podcast, so if you have any questions, just shoot them in the comments down below. Let me know what you're thinking. If you have any feedback, if there's anything you think that I left off or am missing, or if you think there are some contrary examples that prove that at least I'm somewhat wrong about this, I want to hear about it. Let me know in the comments down below. Or are you making an income off of music right now? If so, where does that income come from? Let me know that in the comments down below as well. Or you can email me at podcast at sonicscoop.com. If you've enjoyed listening for this long, you're absolutely crazy, but apparently you don't mind hearing me talk for some crazy reason. So if you want to learn more music and audio production stuff, who better to do it with? You can check out one of my full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs, which will teach you to mix better 
forever. Your finishing rate is going to go way up while your time to complete mixes is going to go way down while your quality and creativity goes up. Is that possible? Absolutely. I guarantee it or your money back. It's got a 30 day money back guarantee. So check it out over at mixingbreakthroughs.com. Or if you want to learn everything I know about mastering, you can check that out over at masteringdemystified.com. Also, last quick little shout out to our brand sponsors of this week, Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free over at soundtoys.com. Or FabFilter, making some of my other favorite plugins. Every single one of them extremely useful with beautiful, uncluttered GUIs, extremely powerful and extremely flexible. Check out anything they make for free as well over at fabfilter.com. Thanks for hanging out with me on this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.